Hello. It is early morning, almost 8.30 in the morning here in Middle Tennessee. And I had a hanging for reading the yearling this morning. <laughs> if you know what I mean. So, here we go. Um, this will go live. Well, we're live now. This will um, be on recorded version. Um, I think about 30 to 45 minutes after we close the live video. So, The Yearling, Chapter 19. The first week in September was as parched and dry as old bones. Only the weeds grew. There was a tension in the heat. The dogs were snappish. The snakes were crawling. Dog days being passed and their shedding and their blindness ended. Penny killed a rattler under the grape arbor that measured seven feet in length. He had seen the coffee weed shaking as though an alligator were passing through and had followed. The rattler, he said, was after the quail to fill his long belly. On, on his way to his winter quarters, he dried the great hide on the smokehouse wall and then hung it on the front room wall beside the fireplace. He said, I like to look at it. I know there's one of the, the boogers will not harm nobody. The heat was the worst of the whole summer. Yet there was a vague change. As though the vegetation sensed the passing of one season and the coming of another. The golden rod and asters and the deer tongue thrived on the dryness. The pokeberries ripened and the birds fed on them along the fence rows. All the creatures, Penny said, were hard put to it for food. The spring and summer berries, the briar berries, the huckleberries, the blueberries and the chokeberries and the wild gooseberries were long since gone. The wild plum and the mayhaw had had no fruit for bird nor beast for many a month. The coons and foxes had stripped the wild grapevines. The fall fruits were not yet ripe. Pawpaw and gallberry and persimmon. The mast of the pines, the acorns of the oaks, the berries of the palmetto would not be ready until first frost. The deer were feeding on the tender growth. Bud of sweet bay and of myrtle, sprigs of wire grass, tips of arrowroot in the ponds and prairies, and succulent lily stems and pads. The type of food kept them in the low, wet places, the swamps, the prairies, and the bayheads. They seldom crossed Baxter's Island. They were hard to hunt in the boggy places. In a month, Penny was able only to bring down one yearling buck. Its spike horns were still in the velvet. They felt like a coarse, rough wood. Shreds hung where the yearling had rubbed them against the saplings to ease the itch of growth and hurry their hardening. Ma Baxter ate them boiled, saying they tasted like marrow. Penny and Jody had no taste for him. They could see too plainly the big eyes under the new horns. The bears, too, were in the low places. They were feeding for the most palmetto, for the most on palmetto buds, ripping out the hearts ruthlessly. The palm hammock around Sweetwater Spring looked as though a hurricane had swept through it. The low growing palmettos were slashed into ribbons. The sweet cream colored cores eaten below the level of the ground. Even some of the tall palms looked as though struck by lightning where a less lazy bear or a hungrier one had scaled the trunk and torn out the bud. The palmettos, Penny said, would die. They were like all living things. They could not live with the heat gone. 
One low palm had been only shredded from the outside. The heart was intact. Penny cut out the smooth cylinder with its hunting knife to carry home to cook. The Baxters liked swamp cabbage as well as the bears. But when them scrapers run short of plum palmeters, Penny said, it's look out for the shoats. You can look to see the bears climbing into the lot most every night now. And your friend Flag here, you best keep him with you faithful, special at night. I'll stand up to your ma do she quarrel about it. Ain't Flag getting too big for a bear to bother? A bear will kill every creature can't outrun him. Why on the prairie one a year? A bear killed my bull. Was not as big as he was. It made him a meal for a week. We come back to it till there was nothing left of the bull but the beller, and that was gone too. Ma Baxter's complaint was at lack of rain. Her rain barrels were empty. All her washing must be done at the sinkhole. The clothes were looking dingy. She said, clothes washes easier anyways on a cloudy day. My, ma, Olla said, soft water. Soft clothes. She needed rainwater, too, to clabber the milk. The milk turned rankly sour in the heat, but would not clabber. In hot weather, she always depended on a few drops of rainwater to cl clabber it, and at every shower would send Jody to a hickory tree to catch some. For rainwater dripped from a hickory was best for the purpose. The Baxters watched the quartering of the September moon anxiously. Penny called his wife and son when the first quarter appeared. The sil sliver crescent, oh, the silver crescent was almost perpendicular. He was jubilant. We'll get rain shore, soon shore, he told them. If the moon was straight across it, he'd push the water out and we'd not get none. But look at it. It'll rain to where you can hang your clothes right on the line and the Lord will wash them. He was a good prophet. Three days later, every sign was of rain. Passing by Juniper Springs from a hunt, he and Jody heard the alligators bellowing. Bats flew in the daytime. Frogs caca, caca steadily at night. The Dominic rooster crowed in the middle of the day. The jaybirds bunched and flew back and forth together, screaming as one. The ground rat rattlers crawled across the clearing in the hot, sunny afternoon. On the fourth day, a flock of white seabirds flew over. Penny shaded his eyes against the sun and watched after them uneasily. He said to Jody, Now the emotion Jessies don't belong to be cross in Florida. I don't like it. It means bad weather, when when I say bad, I mean bad. Jody felt a lift of spirit like the seabirds. He loved storm. It swept in magnificently and shut the family inside in a great coziness. Work was impossible, and they sat about together, and the rain drummed on the hand-hewn shingles. His mother was good-natured and made him syrup candy. And Penny told tales. He said, I hope it's a pure hurricane. Penny turned on him sharply. Don't you wish such a that? A hurricane flattens the crops and drowns the poor sailors and takes the oranges off in the trees. And down south, why, boy, it tears down houses and cold out kills people. Jody said meekly, I won't wish it again, but wind and rain is fine. All right, wind and rain, that's another thing. The sun set strangely that night. The sunset was not red, but green. After the sun was gone, the west turned gray. The east filled with a light, the color of young corn. Penny shook his head. I don't like it. It looks mighty boogerish. In the night, a gust of wind moved through and slammed both doors. The fawn came to Jody's bed and poked its muzzle against his face. He took it up on the bed with him. The morning, however, was clear. 
but the east was the color of blood. Penny spent the morning repairing the roof of the smokehouse. He brought drinking water twice from the sinkhole, filling all available buckets. In the late morning, the sky turned gray and remained so. There was no air stirring. Jody asked, is it a hurricane coming? I don't think, but something's coming. It ain't natural. In mid-afternoon, the skies turned so black that the chickens went to roost. Jody drove in Trixie and the calf and Penny milked early. He turned old Caesar into the lot and put a fork full of the last remaining hay in his manger. Penny said, get the eggs out in the nest. I'm going to the house. Hurry now, else you get catched. The hens were not laying and there were only three eggs in the lot nests. Jody climbed into the corn crib where the old barred rock was laying. The leftover husks rustled under his feet. The dry, sweet-scented air was close and thick. He felt stifled. There were two eggs in the nest, and he put all five inside his shirt and started for the house. He had not felt the hurry that had infected his father. Suddenly, in the false twilight stillness, he took alarm. A great roaring sounded in the distance. All the bears in the scrub meeting at the river might make such a roaring. It was wind. He heard it come closer from the northeast as plainly as though it came on vast webbed feet, brushing the treetops as it, in its passing. It seemed to leap the cornfield in one gust. It struck the yard trees with a hissing, and the mulberries bent their boughs to the ground and the china berry creaked in its brittleness. It passed over him with a rustle like the wings of many geese high-flying. The pines whistled. The rain followed. The wind had been high overhead. The rain was a solid wall from sky to earth. Jody struck it flat as though he dived against it from a great height. It hurled him back and threw him off, off his balance. A second wind seemed now to reach long, muscular fingers through the wall of rain and scoop up everything in its path. It reached down his shirt and into his mouth and in it, eyes and ears and tried to strangle him. He dared not drop the eggs in his shirt. He kept one arm cupped under them and put the other over his face and scudded into the yard. The fawn was waiting, quivering. Its tail hung wet and flat and its ears drooped. It ran to him and tried to find shelter behind him. He ran around the house and to the back door. The fawn bounded close behind him. The kitchen door was latched. The wind and rain blew so hard against it that he could not swing it open. He beat on the thick pine. For a moment he thought he was unheard in the tumult and that he and the fawn would be left outside to drown like biddies. Then Penny lifted the latch from the inside and pushed the door open into the storm. Jody and the fawn darted inside. Jody stood gasping. He wiped the water from his eyes. The fawn blinked. Penny said, who was it now wishing for such as this? Jody said, did I get my wish this quick on us? I'd wish mighty careful. Ma Baxter said, go change them wet clothes right away now. Couldn't you have shut up that phone before you come in? There wasn't no time, Ma. He was wet and scared. Well, long as he don't do no mischief. Now don't put on your good breeches. You got a pair there full of holes as cast in it, as a cast net, but they'll hold together in the house. Penny said after him, Don't he look like a wet yearling crane? All he needs is its tail feathers. Mine ain't growed since spring. She said, I think he'll be right nice looking. Do them freckles fade and that hair ever lay flat and them bones get covered with meat? A few more changes, he agreed innocently, and he'll turn out handsome as the Baxters. Thank the Lord. She looked at him belligerently. And maybe handsome as the Alverses, he added. That makes more sense. You better change your tune. 
I got no idea of starting a ruckus, sweetheart. And you and me pinned up together by no storm. She chuckled with him. Jody, overhearing from his bedroom, could not tell whether they were making fun of him or whether they was indeed hope for his appearance. He said to Flag, You think I'm purty anyways, don't you? Flag butted him. He took it for assurance, and they ambled back to the kitchen. Penny said, Well, it's a three-day noise, sir. A mite early, but I've seen change of season this early many a year. How can you tell it'll be three days, Pa? I'd not sign no papers on it, but generally the first September storm be a three-day nor'easter. The whole country changes. I reckon one way or the other, the world I've heard Oliver Hutto tell a September storm as far off as China. Ma Baxter asked. Why ain't he come to see us this time? Grandma shocks my modesty. But I do like Oliver. I reckon maybe he's had enough of the Foresters for a while and just ain't traveling this road. They'll not fight without he acts quarrelsome, will they? they fit, the fiddle can't play without the vote. I'm feared the Foresters, leastwise limb, will romp on him every time they come up with him until they get the gal business settled. Such doings. Nobody acted that way when I were a gal. No, Penny said. I was the only one wanted you. She lifted the broom and pretend threat. But sugar, he said, the rest just weren't smart as me. There was a lull in the fierce beating wind. A pitiful whine sounded at the door. Penny went to it. Rip had found adequate shelter, but old Julia stood drenched and shivering, poor thing. Or perhaps she had found shelter too, but longed for a comfort that was more than dryness. Penny let her in. Ma Baxter said, now let in Trixie and old season, you'll have things about to suit you. Penny said to Julia, jealous a little old flag, eh? Now you been a Baxter longer than flag. You just come dry yourself. She wagged her slow tail and licked his hand. Jody was warmed by his father's inclusion of the fawn in the family. Flag Baxter. Ma Baxter said, how you men can take on over a dumb creature? I can't see. Call it a dog by your own name and that fawn sleeping right in a bed with Jody. Jody said, he don't seem to like seem like a creature to me, Ma. He seems just like another boy. Well, it's your bed. Long as he don't bring fleas or lice or ticks or nothing into it. He was indignant. Look at him, Ma. Look at that sleekity coat. Smell him, Ma. I don't want to smell him. But he smells sweet. Just like a rose, I suppose. Well, to my notion, wet fur's wet fur. Now, I like the smell of wet fur, Penny said. I mind me one time on a long hunt. I had me no coat and the weather turned cold. It was over about Salt Springs at the head of the run. My, it was cold. And we shot a bear and I dressed out the skin nice. And I slept under it with the fur outside. And in the night come a cold, drizzly rain. And I poked my nose out from under and I smelt that wet fur. Now, to other fellers, Noe G. Ginwright and Bert Harper and Mitt Revels, they said I purely stunk, but I puttened my head back under the bear skin and I was warm as a squirrel in a hollow tree. And that wet bear hide smelled better to me than yellow jessamine. The rain drummed on the roof. The wind whistled under the eaves. Old Julia stretched out on the floor near the fawn. The storm was as cozy as Jody had hoped for. He had made up his mind privately that he would wish for another in a week or two. Now and then, Penny peered out of the window into the dark. It's a toad strangler of rain, he said. Supper was generous. There were cow peas and smoked venison pie and biscuit pudding. Anything that was remotely an occasion stirred Ma Baxter to extra cooking as though her imagination excuse me her imagination could speak only by the use of flour and shortening 
She fed Flag a bit of pudding with her own fingers. Jody, with a secret gratitude, helped her wash and wipe the supper dishes. Penny went to bed shortly after, for her strength did not hold out, but not to sleep. A candle burned in the bedroom, and Ma Baxter brought her piecing, and Jody lay across the foot of the bed. The rain hissed against the window. He said, Pa, tell me a tale. Penny said, I told you all the tales I know. No, you ain't. You all has got another. Well, the only one comes to me. I ain't told. Ain't rightly a tale. I ever tell you about the dog I had when I first come to the island? The dog could cold out study. Jody wriggled closer up to the counterpane. Tell me. Well, sir, the dog was part foxhound and part bloodhound and part just dog. He had long, sorrowful ears, nigh about dragged the ground. And he was so bow-legged he couldn't walk, a sweet potato bed. He had distant, kind old eyes, looking off some ass, and then distracted eyes near about, Caused me to trade him off. Well, I hunted him a while, and it began to come to me. He didn't act like no other dog I'd ever seen. He'd leave a cattail or a fox trail right in the middle and go lay down. The first time, too, first time or two he done it, I figured I just didn't give him, have me no dog at all. Well, sir, it began to come to me. He know what he was doing. Joda boy, go fetch me my pipe. The interruption was exasperating. Jody tingled. He scrambled for the pipe and tobacco. All right now, son. You sit on the floor on a chair and I keep off in the bed. Every time I say trailer track, you jiggle the bed to where I think the slats is busted. That's better. Well, sir. I was obliged to sit down with that dog my own self to see twas, see what twas he was doing. Now, you know how, how a wild cat or a fox will fool most dogs? He'll double back on his own tracks. Yes, sir, he'll double back on his own tracks. He'll get a good start on the dogs and he'll light out and put a heap of distance between them. Then what do he do? He turns right back over his own trail. He cuts as far back as he dares some do, listening all the while for the dogs. Then he cuts off at another angle. So a picture of his trailer looked like a big V, like the ducks make flying. Well, the dog follows the trail he made in the first place, extra strong on account of him having bent over it twice. And then they come to a place where they just ain't no more trail. They nose around and they nose around and they complain. And when they just can't figure no sense to it, they turns back again, backtracking. Of course, they picks up then the turn off with a fox, a cat, cut off in another direction. But all that time is wasted. And nine to one, the cat or fox has made it out of it and got plumb away. Well, what do you figure this lop-eared dog of mine done? Tell me. He figured it out. That's what he done. He figured out that when twas time for the creature to do a double back, and he'd slip back along the trail and lay down and wait. And when Mr. Fox or Mr. Cat come slipping back, there was old Andy waiting to pop out on him. Now, sometimes he'd make his cut off too far back, and did he hang on him long ears when he guessed it wrong? But mostly speaking, he studied it outright, and he catched me more wildcats and more foxes than any dog I ever had before or since. He puffed his pipe. Ma Baxter moved a rocker closer to the candle. It was depressing to have the tail end so soon. What else did old Dandy do, Pa? Well, one day he met his match. A cat or a fox? Neither one. A big old buck was as smart a deer as he was smart a dog. He was a buck with a twisted antler. Each year it growed and twisted. Now a deer don't generally double back on his tracks. 
But now and again, this old buck would do it. And that was just to this sly old dog's liking. But this is where he wasn't smart enough. The buck would do just the opposite to whatever the dog figured he'd do. One time, he'd double back. Next time, he'd keep on running. He'd change his ways every whip stitch. That went on year in, year out. The dog and the buck trying to outsmart each other. Which was the smartest, Pa? How'd it end? You sure you want the answer? He hesitated. He wanted the droopy-eared dog to outsmart the buck. And yet he wanted the buck to get away. Yes, I got to know. I got to know the answer. Well, it's got an answer, but no ending. Oh, Dandy never come up with him. He sighed with relief. That was a proper tale. When he thought of it again, he could picture the dog trailing the buck perpetually. He said, tell another tale like that, and Pa. A tale has got an answer, but no ending. Now, boy, there ain't many tales like that in the world. You best be content with that, Ma Baxter said. I ain't much for dogs. But there was a dog once that I take taken a notion to. He was a bitch, and she had the purdy's coat. I said to the fella owner, when she finds pups, says I'd like one. He said, you're welcome, but twon't do, for you got no way of hunting it. I wasn't yet married to your pa, and a hound'll die, he said, if it ain't hunted. Is she a hound, says I. And he said, yes, ma'am. And I said, then I sure don't want one, for a hound will suck eggs. Jody waited eagerly for the rest of the tale, then understood that was all there was to it. It was like all his mother's tales. They were like hunts where nothing happened. He went back to his thoughts to the dog that could outsmart wildcats and foxes, but never caught the buck. He said, I bet Flag will be smart when he grows up. And he said, what'll you do? Do somebody else's dogs take out after him? His throat constricted. I kill every dog but every man comes here hunting him. Nobody ain't likely to come, is they? Pa said gently. We'll spread the word so his folks will be careful. He's not likely to roam far, no how. Jody decided to keep his gun always loaded against marauders. He slept that night with Flag on the bed beside him. The wind shook the window panes all night, and he slept uneasily, dreaming of clever dogs that ran the fawn mercilessly through the rain. In the morning, he found Penny dressed as for winter in his heavy coat and with a shawl over his head. He was preparing to go out into the storm to milk Trixie, the only chore that was entirely necessary for the time being. There was no lessening of the torrential downpour. Ma Baxter said, Now you be parrot and get back here. Back in here or you'll die of the pneumonia. Jody said, Leave me go. But Penny said, The wind would blow you away, boy. It seemed to him, watching the small bones of his father, leaning against the tumultuous air, that there was little to choose between them in bulk and sturdiness. Penny came in again, drenched and breathless the milk in the gourd spotted by the rain. He said, it's a mercy I toted water yesterday. The day continued as stormy as it had begun. The rain fell in sheets and the wind whipped it in, in under the eaves so that Ma Baxter set pans and gourds to catch it. The rain barrels outside were overflowing and the rain from the roof gurgled into their fullness. Old Julia and the fawn had to be turned out by force. They were both back at the kitchen door in a brief time, wet and shivering. This time, Rip was with them, whining. Ma Baxter protested, but Penny admitted the three. Jody dried them all with the crocus sack rug from in front of the hearth. Penny said, What about do for a lull? The lull did not come. Now and then there seemed to be a few moments when the wind and rain were less intense and Penny rose hopelessly from his chair and peered outside. But he had no sooner decided that he would risk going out to cut wood 
and seated the chickens, then the deluge came again, as violent as before. In the late afternoon, he went out again to milk Trixie, to feed and water Caesar, and to feed the chickens, huddled and frightened and unable to scratch for their living. Ma Baxter made him change his wet clothes immediately. They steamed and dried by the hearth with the sweet, musty smell of wet cloth. Supper was not so ample. Penny was not inclined to tales. The dogs were allowed to sleep in the house, and the family went to bed early. Darkness had come at an unseemly hour, and it was impossible to tell the time. Jody awakened at what would ordinarily have been an hour before daylight. The world was dark, and the rain was still falling, the wind still blowing. Penny said, we'll get a break this morning. It's a three-day nor'easter, all right. The such a rain. I'll be proud to see the sun. The sun did not appear. There was no morning break. In mid-afternoon, there came the lull that Penny had expected the day before, but it was a gray lull, the roof dripping, the trees soaked, the earth sodden. The chickens came out from their huddle for a few forlorn moments and scratched half-heartedly. Penny said, We'll get a change of wind now, and I'll be clear and fine. The change of wind came. The gray sky turned green. The wind roared in from a distance as before. When it came, it was not from the northeast, but from the southeast, and it brought more rain. Penny said, I've never seen such a thing. The rain was more torrential than before. It poured down as though Juniper Creek and Silver Glen Run and Lake George and the St. John's River had all emptied over the scrub at once. The wind was no fiercer than before, but it was gusty, and there was no end to it. It blew and rained and blew and rained and blew and rained. Penny said, this must be the way the Lord made that blasted ocean. Ma Baxter said, hush, you'll be punished. Can't be no worse punished, woman. The tails will be rotted in the corn flat and the hay root and the cane. The yard was afloat. Jody looked out of the window and saw two drowned biddies floating about in up with upturned bellies. Penny said, I've seen things in my time, but I've never seen a thing like this. Jody offered to go to the sinkhole for drink water. Penny said, It'll be nothing but rainwater and rile to boot. They drank rainwater from the pan under the northwest corner of the house. It had, faintly, had a faintly woody taste from the cypress shingles. Jody did the evening chores. He went out of the kitchen door with the milk gourd into a strange world. It was a lost and desolate world, like the beginning of time or the end of it. The vegetation was beaten flat. A river ran down the road so that a flat bottom boat could have gone down it to clear, clear to Silver Glen. The familiar pines were like trees at the bottom of the sea, washed across not with mere rain, but with tides and currents. It seemed to him that he might swim to the top of the rain, but the water was knee deep in the lot, which lay at a lower level than the house. Trixie had broken down the bars that separated her from the calf and had taken it with her to a high corner. They were stood huddled together. The calf had taken most of the milk and he was able only to draw a quart or so from the drained udders. The passage between the stalls and the corn crib was a sluice way. He meant to gather the dry husks for extra feed for Trixie, but the water swept through so discouragingly that he decided to let her make out until morning with the hay from the loft. It was a good thing, he thought, that the new crop of hay would soon be ready. There was little left. He did not know whether to try to separate the overgrown calf from the cow again. There was no place to put it where it would be dry, yet the Baxters needed the milk as badly. He decided to wait and ask his father, coming back again if necessary. He fought his way outside and plodded through the house. The rain blinded him. 
The clearing seemed alien and unfriendly. He was glad to push open the door and to put back to be again inside the house. The kitchen seemed safe and intimate. He made his report on conditions. Penny said, best leave the calf to stay with its mammy a time like this. We can make out without milk till morning. It'll surely be clear by then. Morning brought no abatement. Penny paced up and down the kitchen. He said, my daddy told of a storm in the 50s was mighty bad, but I don't reckon all Florida history has had such a rain. The days passed with no change. Ma Baxter usually left the weather in Penny's hands, but now she cried and sat rocking with her hands folded. On the fifth day, Penny and Jody made a rush to the pea field to pull enough cow peas for a meal or two. The peas were flattened. They pulled up the whole vines with their backs to the rain and wind. They stopped at the smokehouse for a peak of piece of pickled meat from the bare buck forester she had shot on his last night with them. Penny remembered that his wife was short of cooking grease. They tipped the can and held the golden bear grease and filled with filled a stone crop. They tipped the can that held the golden bear grease and filled a stone crop. They laid the meat over the top to protect it and rushed for the house. The cow peas were already molding on the outside, but the peas inside were still firm and good. Supper was again a feast. There was the wild honey to fall back on, and Ma Baxter made a pudding sweetened with its rich flavor, tasting faintly of wood and smoke. Penny said, Don't seem possible, little not Claire, by morning, but if so be, Taint Jody, you and but if so be taint, Jody, you and me had best get out in it and pull as many peas as we can manage. Ma Baxter said, But how'll I keep them? Cook them, woman, and warm them over every day if need be. The morning of the sixth day was exactly like the others. Since they would be drenched in any case, Penny and Jody stripped to their breeches and went to the field with sacks. They worked until noon in the downpour, pulling the slippery pods from the bushes. They came in for a hurried dinner and went back again without troubling to change the clothes. They covered most of the field. The hay, Penny said, was a total loss, but they would do what they could to save the peas. Some of the pods were mature. They spent the evening and late into the night shelling the peas, sticky and moldering. Ma Baxter built up a slow fire on the hearth and spread out the peas close to the heat to dry. Jody was awakened several times in the night by the sound of some someone going out to the kitchen to replenish the fire. The morning of the seventh day might have been the morning of the first. The gusty wind whipped around the house as though it had always blown and always would blow. The sound of the rain on the roof and the rain barrels was now so familiar that it was not noticed. At daylight, a limb of the china berry crashed to the ground. The Baxters sat silently to breakfast. Penny said, well, Job taken to worse punishment than this. Least ways none of us ain't got rises. Ma Baxter snapped. Find the good in it. That's right. There ain't no good in it. Lest it, it is to remind a man to be humble. For there's never a thing on earth he can call his own. After breakfast, he took Jody to the cornfield. The corn had been broken on the stalks before the storm. The stalks were beaten to the ground, but the ears were unharmed. They gathered them and brought them, too, into the warm, dry refuge of the kitchen. Bob Baxter said, I ain't got the peas dried yet. How I dry all this? Penny did not answer but went to the front room and kindled a fire on the hearth. Jody went outside to bring in more wood. The wood was soaked through, but when the fat wood was heated a little while it would burn, heated a little while it would burn, Penny strode the ears of corn on the floor. He said to Jody, Now, your job is to keep changing it so as it'll all get them out of the heat. Ma Baxter said, How's the cane? It's flat. 
What you reckon has happened to the taters? He shook his head. In the late afternoon, he went to the sweet potato field and dug enough for supper. They were beginning to rot. By trimming, some were usable. Again, supper seemed lavish because of the sweet potatoes. Penny said, There ain't no change by morning. We just as good quit fighting and lay down and die. Jody had never heard his father speak so disconsolately. It froze him through. Flag was showing the effect of short rations. His ribs and backbone were visible. He bleated often. Penny had given up all attempt to milk the cow for the sake of the calf. In the middle of the night, Jody awakened and thought he heard his father about. It seemed to him the rain was falling less violently. He was asleep again before he could be certain. He awakened on the morning of the eighth day. Something was different. There was a silence instead of tumult. The rain had stopped. The long winds were still. A light, the color of pomegranate blossoms, sifted through the gray, wet atmosphere. Penny flung all the doors and windows wide open. Tain't much of a world to go out to, he said, but let's all go out and be thankful. There's a world at all. The dogs pushed past him and bounded out side by side. Penny smiled. Dog, if ain't, if taint like going out in the ark, he said. The animals two by two. Or right, come on, go out with me. Jody jumped about and leaped down the steps with the fawn. We're the two deer, he called. Ma Baxter looked across the fields and began to cry again. But the air, Jody felt, was cool and sweet and gracious. The fawn shared his feeling and bounded over the yard gate with, a swift, with swift twinkling heels. The world was devastated with the flood, but it was indeed, as Penny kept reminding his wife, the only world they had. And that is the end of chapter 19. There are 408 pages in this book, and we are on page 227. So we have a little while to go. I think we have about 14 more chapters. But I think they experienced a couple of hurricanes that came together. What do you think? No, Jan, this is not the last chapter. Thanks for asking. We are in chapter 19, and this is chapter uh, this is chapter 19, and there are 33 chapters. So, yeah. It's a long book, but it's good. I think he, the author did a really good job of explaining what it's like to be in a hurricane can't imagine you know nowadays we have so many buildings and things that are destroyed by hurricanes but I can't imagine your only livelihood all the food that you've grown all the hay for the animals is completely destroyed until next time my friends may the Lord bless you and keep you May he make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you his peace.